I'm going to begin virtual church today in a slightly unusual way um, by praying for the American people after the unexpected events in, in Washington. And let's just pray for them at this critical juncture. Dear Father, we bring to you our alarm and sadness to see America so divided and such chaos breaking out at the heart of its government and democracy. And we pray for the rule of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, to break out in that situation. We ask that people, instead of turning against one another uh, with weapons, will turn to each other with forgiveness and will seek to bring peace to their nation and to the world. We commend this situation to you, dear Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, and as we pray, um, please don't forget that uh, a long time ago now, last March, when the pandemic first started, we called upon people, if they wish to, to just all, all pray at 12, even if it's only for a moment or two. And that way we can know that we're all just standing together for a few moments and continuing to be one body in Christ, even if we're separated physically. I know some people have been carrying that on uh, since those days, and well done those, but just a reminder, uh, perhaps in the length of days and all the other priorities that come up, it, it, maybe it's a good time to start again. Well, we're continuing to look at Isaiah, and one of my favourite prophecies from Isaiah comes in the very next chapter from Isaiah chapter 6 and his great vision of the sovereign Lord whose glory fills the whole earth. A vision that was to uh, undergird the whole of Isaiah's ministry as he looks to see the greatness of God working out uh, in all the situations here on earth. We're now actually in the space of one chapter in chapter 7, jumping ahead at least 16 years. We're told that in elsewhere in the Bible there's an in the year King, King Uzziah died, the time of Isaiah's vision, well, his son Jotham became king and reigned for 16 years. And then his grandson, or oh, Jotham's son Ahaz, took over. And Ahaz was not a good king. He uh, went in for idolatry a great deal. This very much annoyed Jeremiah, uh, sorry, Isaiah, who actually has a very strong polemic to make against idolatry. He's always uh, jeering at idols for being senseless and useless. And how can people have the idiocy to worship something as God that they've made with their own hands? Uh, so um, that, that's going on at this time. And during this time, Ahaz's rule became threatened uh, from a variety of different uh, forces. Uh, in fact, the worst one, the most, the one that shook everyone the most, was when Aram, corresponding to modern-day Syria, more or less, uh, decided to make war on Judah and Jerusalem, and the northern kingdom of Israel joined in with Aram. So their own brothers and sisters from the north kingdom uh, actually formed an alliance for the destruction of the people. And it says early on in chapter 7 that uh, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. That's just another word for the north kingdom. So the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. And uh, it's in this context when everything's being shaken, when chaos is breaking out, that Isaiah steps forward and brings his prophecy to Ahaz the king. And this is what happens. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of Jacob. Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with the child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. 
He will eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. But before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. So um, Isaiah's message is basically God is in charge. But don't give up, don't let your heart be shaken. God is in charge. And he does it through this most wonderful sign, Emmanuel. Now this may be, uh, very often in scripture we find that prophecies have more than one reference. It may be a reference to uh, Ahaz's son, who would become the good king Hezekiah, who would be reigning over Israel at the time that, sorry, over Ju Judah and Jerusalem at the time that they saw off the invasion of the Assyrians through God's mighty help and remarkable intervention. Uh, so that, that might be the initial thing, that might be about the boy being old enough to, to choose right and wrong and this sort of thing. This problem uh, about Aram and Israel will just be overwhelmed by a much greater problem of the Assyrians coming. But Hezekiah turned out to be a good and righteous king. And there's a lot more about his reign uh, in Isaiah's prophecies. But of course the other reference, the one that immediately springs to mind for Christian people to the name Emmanuel is because this prophecy is quoted and applied to Jesus in Matthew's Gospel. So Matthew writes this, now this is in chapter 1, and it's focused particularly uh, on what happened with Joseph, Jesus' stepfather as it were. And uh, so he's been puzzling what's been going on with Mary, what this is all about, and uh, God speaks to him in a dream, and this is what God says. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they'll call him Emmanuel which means God with us. And yes, that is a literal translation of the name Emmanuel, God with us. So um, Matthew doesn't make any difficulty about whether there was an initial reference to Ahaz's son, Hezekiah. Uh, he does say this is applied directly to Jesus. He's called Jesus but he also inherits the title Emmanuel, God with us. So God was going to be with Hezekiah through very troubled and difficult times for the nation. Um, but God, in an even deeper way, is with us through Jesus. And it's particularly beautiful that this name is given at the very time that in the person of Jesus, God literally does come to share with us, to share in our flesh and blood, becoming a human being like us, to share in our experiences of being parented, of being a child, of having to grow up and learn things, making friends, losing them. He's become the man of sorrows who understands our pain, our struggles and our suffering, and who even identifies with us by bearing our sins. He experiences all our, ex our own experiences of bereavement, of loss, of death itself on the cross. God is with us so that we can say, when we go through any of these things, God has been there because Jesus walked this way ahead of us. We can know that God is with us however hard it all looks and however difficult uh, uh, it might be. Well, Jesus walked through that valley that we're going through. 
But not only that, it, because his name is Jesus who saves us from our sins, it means that he's going to be with us for an awful lot longer than just a few years that we're on this earth. Because he rose, because he's in glory with his Father, well, he's with us and he'll raise us to be with him. And God will be with us and we'll be with him for eternity if we will follow in his footsteps. So, yeah, Hezekiah would see some great victories. In fact, the name uh, Emmanuel is used twice more in Isaiah chapter 7, if you read it, read, read forward. And it talks about how even against Assyria, God will be with them, God will defend them, God will champion them, champion their cause, and see them through those hard times. And um, that's uh, also what Jesus has done for us. He's been our champion. He's overcome the forces of darkness, the power of sin, of condemnation, of guilt, and of death itself to be with us forevermore. So what a beautiful name. Take time to contemplate it. You think about that today. Emmanuel, he's with me. Life isn't easy at the moment, but he understands that. He's with me in it. Say that name to yourself a few times. Particularly hard times, lonely times, anxious times. You are with me. It's your name. We say that, don't we, as somebody who's really good at something. Well, um, being good at things is his middle name. This is perhaps Jesus' middle name, uh, Emmanuel. His middle name is God is with us. He's with you today. So let's just pray and ask to know that presence alive in our hearts and amidst our difficulties today. Emmanuel, God is with us. You are with me. Thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you for your understanding. Thank you for sharing the hard times so that we can share in your peace and joy and love. And as we thank you for your presence in our own hearts, we pray for other people who are going through a hard time at the moment. The anxious, the sick, the sad, and the lonely. And we say over each one of them, as we picture their faces and think of their names, Emmanuel, God is with you. God bless you and see you on virtual church next time. Bye for now.